So after weeks and weeks of unprecedented spending, the government is finally willing to let Canadians in on the state of the nation's pocketbook, well, sort of. We spoke to the finance minister, Bill Morneau, about this yesterday when the so-called fiscal snapshot was announced for July 8th. That was when lawmakers yesterday were debating, and we shouldn't overlook this, $87 billion in spending. They only had four hours to do so, what some are calling the most expensive four hours in Canadian parliamentary history. But there's lots of confusion. The parliamentary budget officer says a full fiscal update is needed and it's doable. We're talking about accountability. So yesterday I had this conversation with the finance minister and I started our conversation by asking the finance minister what exactly he means by the term fiscal snapshot. Here's what he said. We uh, really, for not for weeks, Evan, but really since the beginning of this crisis have said that the, the economic situation is, is very fluid. We've had a, an enormous response, obviously, in terms of the investments we've made on behalf of Canadians, but we've had a, a, a very significant decline in economic activity. So, so it has been very hard to uh, know where the economy was, but I think what we're seeing right now is that we, we think it's important for us to provide an understanding at a point in time of where we're at. So what are the investments? Where are we at from the underlying economy that gives us a frame of, of what we see next steps looking like? And that's, that's what we are looking forward to doing on July 8th. Okay, but, you know, a fiscal update or an economic update, the parliamentary budget officer has been on this program. He said you guys should be able to make the projections. The government of Saskatchewan has done it. Uh, you know, this would be a much more complete picture including the revenues, including the spending, and give a real picture. Why, why can't you do something that's more thorough that the parliamentary budget officer says they're doing, you should clearly be able to do? We think it's, it's very important that Canadians have confidence in what we put forward. So thinking about what Saskatchewan might do, that's important, but we're looking at 10 provinces and three territories at a different stage of, of safe restart, and we want to make sure that we give people an understanding of where we're at. Really, the issue is we don't think that projections at this time, given that the, the economic outcome is going to be very much aligned with the health outcomes, are, are helpful. So what we're going to do is give people a sense of where we are right now. We think that's critical. And it's entirely consistent with what we're seeing around the world. I mean, we saw the OECD last week acknowledge that they couldn't really do a projection, so they gave two scenarios of what the future might look like. So I think what you'll see from us, Evan, is, is an understanding of the kinds of investments we've made, a sense of what the underlying economy looks like, and that will provide the frame for our next steps. It'll, of course, include uh, the way we, we see the situation right now and an acknowledgement of what we don't know, which is uh, how this is going to fold out over the course of the coming months. Okay, so you're saying the forecast, because you've got the new governor of the Bank of, of Canada telling the House of Commons Finance Committee that their July monetary policy report will have a forecast. It'll also be scenarios, but a forecast as well. So you're saying forecasting is going to be sketchy, but will you have a complete picture of both the revenue side and the expenditure side on this? We will have uh, all of the information that we have incorporated in this July 8th uh, uh, pr presentation of our economic situation. So it will include, of course, the revenues that we expect to come in this year. It will exclude, include the expenditures that we propose. It will give people a sense of, of where we're at. And I think it's, it's pretty consistent with what you heard the new governor, uh, Tiff Macklem, talking about uh, yesterday. We recognize that there's, there's always going to be a, uh, a heightened level of uncertainty in the, in the economy we find ourselves in. And our goal is to be transparent. Our goal is also to give people confidence that we, we understand where we're at, and that's what we'll do. But let's focus on the CERB. You've extended it by eight weeks. Uh, will it be extended further, Minister? Possible? We, uh, we've extended it for eight weeks because we think that that's the, uh, the amount of time that we need to ensure that we bridge people when they don't have access to jobs. So we all understand that the first 16 weeks, which, which would have expired for over 5 million Canadians in, in early July, is going to leave a lot of people hanging. So in the, in the summertime, we also expect to work on our employment insurance system to make sure that we can transition in an appropriate way, providing Canadians with continuing support. So, so there is more work to be done. Uh, we've said through this that uh, during a time of crisis, we're going to support Canadians. During a time of crisis, we're, we're going to support the organizations they work for so they can maintain their job over time. And that's what we'll continue to do. 
I cannot predict for you uh, the future, Evan. It's going to very much be about how our, uh, our health outcomes are and the way we're able to open right. up our economy. And, and as, that, as that happens, we'll have a better sense of, of what the programs need to be to support people. But is it, for example, if you're going to replace the CERB, you could do it with uh, expansion of EI if people are actually eligible because there will be problems eligibility-wise. Some are saying that you may have a guaranteed um, basic income. Are those questions, are, in other words, do you have scenarios to replace the CERB with those kind of programs? What, we, what we're looking at right now, there's you know, roughly 5.6 million people that would come off the uh, CERB if it were to end in, in early July. So we've extended it for eight weeks. And what that does is it allows us the, the time to make sure that we support yeah. people as we get to the next phase. Of those 5.6 million people, about 3.4 million of them are people who would normally be in the EI system, which means that there's 2.2 or more million people, many of whom we hope will find jobs, but, but some of whom won't. And we need to think about how we ensure those people in a time of crisis have enough money to buy groceries and pay their rent. So, so there is more work to be done, Evan. I'm not, I'm not uh, at a stage yet, and our team is, is working on how we can do that. And as we have more information, we'll come out. But I think what I want Canadians to know is that we think that in a crisis, we need to find a way to bridge through the crisis. And that's what we've done, I think, pretty successfully so far. I mean, there are things that we need to continue to improve on, uh, but we need to continue with that, with that mandate so that we can we can get through and have an economy at the other end that will you know allow us to continue to have good jobs and and, and growth that we need for for raising our children and getting to the next generation but one of the, this is expensive though i mean the, the costs are historic and you know the deficit is absolutely ballooning and again we'll go back to the transparency 87 billion dollars in four hours it's just these are numbers I, i've literally never seen before no one's ever seen these kind of numbers do you have an economic recovery plan already uh, you know, we are, we are at a phase where we're at the safe restart phase. So we are looking now at how do we, how do we manage these programs as businesses get up and running, and how do we manage the support that we need during that time period. I think for us to presume we know what a full recovery plan would look like at this stage would be, there would be hubris in that. We need to see where, where our situation goes in order to figure that out. And to think about, you know, the, the issues around where the demand might need to be in the fall. Right. If we see a demand uh, come back that allows our economy to get back in a strong position, that's a different outcome than if we have uh, further health challenges. So, so we will, of course, be doing that planning, uh, but we don't have the information to, uh, to get you the next phase at this stage. Would you consider, look, if, if we need support, I mean, you're, you're going to supposedly, for the last three months, more support for the energy sector. There's support, uh, the, talking about the CERB and the millions of Canadians using it. Eventually, you're going to realize you need to do one thing, and maybe it's either increase revenue some way. Will you raise taxes? Is that on the table to get Canada back onto a stable fiscal ground? Is raising taxes on the table? No, it's not on the table, Evan. And, and the reason for that is at a time when we're, we're seeing the economy that's, that's gone down so precipitously, the last thing we would want to do would be to raise taxes. We're in a situation where we actually need to think about how we get our economy back up and running. So it's, it's putting uh, right. resources into the economy. It's increasing demand. So, so that would be the opposite of what we'd want to do at this time. So our, our, our focus will be on supporting people as we get back to a, to a new normal. And, and we, right. we continue to believe that the idea of, of supporting people who can't get back to work while at the same time creating incentives for businesses to get people back to work is the right way to go in right. the balance. You know, I'm talking with uh, you know, colleagues, uh, finance ministers around the world, I spoke to a few of them today, who are facing similar sorts of challenges. We're all trying to take that approach where we, we support people that need to be supported, we try and get businesses back up and running in a way that makes sense. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic that this safe restart will allow us to get to a better position. But we do need to ensure that we support Canadians through this crisis as, as the challenge continues. Okay, I got one quick question. I know you've got to get back to the House. You know that one of your colleagues, Nathaniel Erskine-Smith, wants to call uh, executives from the grocery chains to a parliamentary committee because all three of them, Sobeys, Metro and Loblaw, all decided mysteriously on the exact same day to get rid of their pandemic pay, $2 an hour increase. They're making record profits, they're paying bonuses, and they're clawing back their pandemic pay. Uh, do you agree that they should be called, and are you concerned about potential collusion? 
I, I, I never uh, cast aspersions at, at people without, uh, without real information, so I have, I have no way of, of ascertaining how those organizations came to that conclusion. I presume it's their, their business decision. Uh, so, you know, the House of Commons it has uh, the powers to do what, what, uh, what it wants to do, and uh, we'll see them, uh, you know, utilize those powers. Uh, I'm in a position where I can say that the, the essential workers uh, that work for grocery stores, the, the organizations that have kept us fed during this last few months that have been so challenging, they've done really important work, and, you know, there'll be others that will, will look at their practices and, and have questions. Uh, that's, that's appropriate. All right. Well, a lot of public backlash on that. Uh, Minister Morneau, always good to have you on the program, so thank you. Okay. Thanks very much. Take care.